You're listening to a message delivered at First Family Church in Bondurant, Iowa, from a sermon series, Son of God, Servant of Man, going through the Gospel of Mark. For more information and messages, please visit our website at www.ffcblife.com. Well, I want to commend you, first of all, on the spiritual maturity level that this church displays right when you walk in the door. Most churches have a big clock on the back wall so that the preacher doesn't go long. You guys have it back here. (laughs) So, Michael, if you could give me a, like when I hit five hours, if you could give me one of those, yeah, about three o'clock, that would be great. So, uh, I'm, I'm not... When I walked in this morning, I told Mark, I'm like, I'm not really comfortable or used to preaching with a pagan symbol glaring at me from the back of the room. Lucas with his OU symbol right on his t-shirt there. But then Lucas said, well, hey, if it bothers you, I'll just take the shirt off. And I'm like, oh, no, now we're in a whole new territory here, so... We're going to be looking at uh, Mark 2 this week. So if you want to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 23. So we are in um, the third part of a mini-series that we called Q&A with Jesus. And what we've been witnessing over the last several weeks as we've been working through Mark chapter 2 is an increasing amount of tension between the Jewish religious leaders and Jesus. And it starts kind of subtly. So if you, if you remember back to the first part of Mark chapter 2, Jesus um, is confronted with a, a paralytic man. Remember, they cut a hole in the roof and they lower him down. And this was our first kind of glimpse of the conversation between the, the religious leaders and Jesus. And so Jesus has the audacity to say to this young man, um, your sins are forgiven. And right away, the religious leaders are thinking to themselves, wait a minute, only God can can forgive sins. And so that creates this this kind of short, tense dialogue, but the, the religious leaders really don't do much at that point. It's more like, the story ends and, and they go on their way, but you can tell they're watching him now. But they're definitely concerned about what this, this guy, this, this rabbi from Galilee is doing. And so then the next scene that Mark gives us is one where Jesus calls a new disciple, Levi. And Levi happens to be a tax collector. And tax collectors were hated people. And so as part of his probably transition, going from being a tax collector to a disciple. Levi invites Jesus into his home, and who do you think he invites to meet Jesus? His friends. Well, who are his friends? Other tax collectors. And so you see the religious leaders still kind of on the outside, but now they're, now they're kind of whispering to the disciples, like, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? So they're wondering what, you know, this isn't appropriate. This is not how a rabbi should act. This is not how a good Jew should act. So then Mark takes us to the next scene. And this one involves fasting. And again, Jesus and his disciples are not fasting according to the laws of the Jews. Now remember, there's only one day that the law requires the Jews to fast. And that is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And so all the rest of the days are made up of man-made rules. And so now there's even increasing confrontation because Jesus is violating this, what they see as an important law, the law of fasting. And each time, Jesus tamps them down with greater logic than what they are demonstrating. And so now we come to the fourth and final scene between the, the religious leaders and Jesus. And this involves the Sabbath. So let's read our text, and then we'll kind of dig into this. It starts in chapter 2, verse 23, and it goes through until 
chapter 3, verse 6. So there's two different examples that Mark gives us. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hard-heartedness, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and the hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. So we've seen this escalating tension, and this comes to the head right here. This is, as we'll see when we get to the end here, this, this is a tipping point in the book of March. Mark as we see Jesus in his march towards the cross in Jerusalem. This one involves the Sabbath. Now, to understand what the Jews are digging at here, you have to understand the significance of the Sabbath to the Jewish people. There's two things that probably identify the Jews on a, a core level and really give them a cultural identity and an a identity as the children of God. The first one was circumcision, which identified them with the covenant of Abraham. And the second was the Sabbath. So they hold the Sabbath in high regard. This is, this is kind of the pinnacle of all of their, um, their laws that have kind of been compiled over the years. And the, the Sabbath is a unique law because it was given as part of the Ten Commandments. So if you were to go into Exodus 20... And if you remember the scene in the movie where God's finger was writing on the stone tablets and the, he created the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath was the fourth of those commandments. But it actually predates the law. It goes back to the time of creation. So if you were to read in Genesis 1 and 2, the days of creation, the last day, the seventh day, was the day that God set aside his work and said, it's complete, it's finished, it's time to rest. So the Sabbath has a, a, a significant part. It literally means to cease. That's what the word Sabbath means. It comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to cease, to rest. And so the purpose of it is really of benefit. I mean, God is looking at mankind and he's saying, I'm giving you the gift of a day of rest. But the Jews, over time, have compounded this. So, what happens is, if you go back into your Old Testament history, you'll remember that in 586, the temple in Jerusalem were destroyed by the, by the Babylonians. And basically, the Jewish identity was wiped out at that point. There was no more Jerusalem. There was no more temple. The Jews were taken out of Israel, and they were carried away into Babylon as exiles. And they stayed there for 70 years, which is a generation. So very few people who remember Judaism as before the, the exile are living when the Jews begin to filter back into the, the Holy Land. And part of the, the process is rediscovering their scriptures, rediscovering the law. So the, the scribes and the Pharisees actually played an important role. Ezra was a scribe. And his, he was one of the key people that helped to bring the law back to light and helped them to restore. But over time, what happens is that they begin layering on requirements, man's requirements. So 
The, sa- the Sabbath is a great illustration of what happens when this, when this takes place. So here's, here's the, the laws of the Sabbath. God means it to be a, a time of rest. But here's how the, the Jews have interpreted this by the time Jesus is walking on the earth. They look at this as a, a um, categorical list of do's and don'ts. So, for example, I'll just read you. Thir- there's 39 categories or tasks that are prohibited on the Jewish Sabbath. These include sowing, plowing, reaping, binding, threshing, winnowing, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing, bleaching or dyeing wool, spinning, weaving, tying or untying a knot, sewing or tearing two stitches, hunting, riding or racing more than two letters, building, demolishing, kindling or extinguishing a fire, hammering, carrying an object from one place to another. That's, that's just a, a sampling of the law that re- governs the Sabbath. So here's how crazy this gets. They have a, a rule that they put in place that's called a Sabbath day journey. So according to their law, you can travel about 2,000 steps or 3,000 feet, okay, from your home. That's the law. A Sabbath day journey is about 3,000 feet from your home. So if you live over in this neighborhood and it's 4,000 feet to get into this neighborhood, somewhere in the Jewish tradition, they came up with the idea that if you tether houses together, it qualifies as you still being at home. So the Jews would take a rope and they would run it from one house to the other house to the other house so they could extend that 3,000 circle circumference. So they could go from this house over here and as long as there were ropes connecting them back to their house, they could go as far as they needed to go. So even today, if you go into some Jewish Orthodox neighborhoods, you'll see ropes being strung between homes so that they can stay within their Sabbath day's journey. Am, am I the only one that's like, that's crazy. I mean, where, where do you find that in the Bible? I mean, wh- how do you go from this is a day of rest to you need to string ropes between your houses so that you don't violate the Sabbath law and break that rule. Now, here's, here's where this gets really dangerous, okay? And this is what we're going to begin to see with Jesus. And this happens with legalism. So, think again about the Ten Commandments. Most of us probably know several. So, like, there's, you know, thou shalt not take my name in vain. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath day. Thou shalt not... Um, bear false witness or lie. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt, you know, and then we get into thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill or murder. Right? So, there's three categories of law within just the Ten Commandments. There's ceremonial law. There is the, the moral law. And then there's what they call the judicial law. So, most of us would probably identify pretty quickly with where those fall. So, for example, we would look at the Sabbath and we would say, is that a law that we should obey? No, that's a ceremonial law. That was something that was unique to the Jews, right? Then we go to the second one, the moral law. Are those things, yeah, those are things you teach your kids when they're growing up. I mean, it's, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, people believe in moral laws. It's wrong to lie. It's wrong to take something from someone else or to covet something else. And then you get into the judicial laws. And we would agree with those, too. It's wrong to kill, right? It's wrong to steal. The problem is the judicial laws have severe penalty. So, for example, you kill somebody, what's the penalty? Death. An eye for an eye, right? So, if you, according to the law, you kill, you, you kill somebody, then your life is demanded of you. Here's what the Jews have done by the time Jesus comes along. They've taken 
a lot of these ceremonial laws, like the Sabbath, and they've transferred them over into judicial laws. So, it is not just wrong to violate the Sabbath. You are committing a penalty worthy of death if you violate the Sabbath. They take this very seriously. And who gets to determine whether you're violating the Sabbath? The religious leaders. They serve as the judge, jury, and executioner in this whole process. So that begins to set for you the, the context of how important this is now. When you see Jesus' disciples walking through a grain field, and they pick some grain. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's hard not to imagine that the Pharisees are not purposely watching Jesus and his disciples at this point to see if they can catch him. I mean, they're walking through a field. And I can almost see the Pharisees just kind of trailing behind them, just watching, waiting to see. And they see Jesus' disciples reach over there and they pluck an ear of corn off of a stock. Now, here's the question. What's illegal about plucking the ear of corn from the stock? It's not the fact that they're taking the corn. That's something that according to Deuteronomy 23:25, they're permitted to do. If you're walking through a field and you're hungry, you can pluck an ear of corn off of the, the stock as long as you don't take a sickle to it, which they consider harvesting. So it's not stealing to just reach over and take an ear of corn. The problem is the time of day that they're doing it, which is the Sabbath day. And so the Pharisees, looking at that, they see Jesus' disciples plucking an ear of corn on the Sabbath, and they go, gotcha. What law did they violate? Reaping. They violated the law of reaping on the Sabbath day. And if they can prove that it was an intentional violation... What's the penalty? Death. This is severe stuff. And so they come to Jesus and they say, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath day? And Jesus answers them with such... Uh, there, there's so much in this answer. And it's just, it's just a couple of verses. He says, Have you never read... Which, first off, that's kind of a... Look, you guys are the experts of the law, Right? Have you never read what the Bible says? Let's talk about the law. Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? Now, what is Jesus subtly doing there? He's saying, David, the unrecognized king of Israel who was on the run from Saul, who was no longer the authorized king of Israel, was doing something. So what, what comparison is Jesus making to himself here? Jesus, the unrecognized king of Israel, who is essentially on the run from this renegade group of Pharisees who think they're in charge, but really they're not. So he's drawing the comparison here between his men and himself and David and his men. And he says, verse 26, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and he also gave it to those who were with him. So, here's the story that Jesus is referencing. And this is from um, 1 Samuel, and if you'll recall back when we were studying our book of Samuel, this is the time when David is on the run from Saul. And he's literally out of food. He's, he, he has, his men are hungry, and so he he remembers that the showbread, the, the bread of presence, is sitting right there in the, in the tabernacle. And so he goes and he asks the priest if he can have that bread. And the priest grants him the food. Because the, cre the priest makes a decision that human life is of more value than the law that was guarding the, the showbread. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying... Man is more important than the law. And the priest made that determination back in the time of David. And so he draws this comparison, and then he says something that is simple but stunning. He says to them, The Sabbath was made for man, 
and not man for the Sabbath. So, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And you can almost hear the Pharisees start spitting and sputtering at that point because what Jesus just said is that He, the Son of Man, is the Lord of the Sabbath. Who is the Lord of the Sabbath? Who created the Sabbath? Who was the author of the Sabbath? It was God himself. And so Jesus is making this audacious claim to this group of Pharisees by saying that he, the Son of Man, is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I want you to kind of understand how this is all playing out with these Pharisees. And so I used kind of as a, an example, um, our own law, system of law. So our, our system of law is based upon the Constitution and then 250 years of court findings, right? So we've got this document that was written 250 years ago, and then over the last 250 years, the courts have interpreted this document to mean this. And some of the things that the courts interpret are really kind of crazy. I mean, it's like, where is this in the Constitution? So imagine if in our day and age, we were to have an issue come forward, and we've got a court sitting right here full of all of these very highly qualified judges. And the judges are sitting here and they're debating whether this law is constitutional or not, and they're coming in. And into the room walks James Madison. Now, James Madison is credited with writing a significant part of the Constitution. He is an author of the Constitution. So he's not speaking as someone who just says, well, here's what I think. He's speaking as an original author. He can say, here's what I meant when I wrote those words. And these judges would be sitting here saying, well, I think this is what the, inter the Constitution is saying. So do you see the, the power play that's involved here? Because Jesus is claiming with this Lord of the Sabbath that he is, in fact, the author of that law. And the judges, the Pharisees, they're just interpreters of it. And this, so you can begin to see what kind of threat they believe Jesus is posing. Because remember, everywhere he's going, he's drawing huge crowds. That's one of the first things that Mark established for us, was the crowds that are following Jesus. He goes into a, a community, a town, and it's just like people just swamp him. So he's drawing these huge crowds, and he's gaining a lot of popularity, and he's gaining a lot of influence, but he's challenging the very system upon which their culture is built. And so then Mark takes us, into this next example. And this one, again, deals with the Sabbath, but this time it's dealing with a man with a withered hand. So we'll pick it up um, in verse 1. And he entered into a synagogue, and a man there whose hand was withered. And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. So there's the picture. You have this room just like this, okay? This is a synagogue. People come to worship. It's the Sabbath day. In walks Jesus. He's coming down the aisle, and as he's walking down the aisle, he happens to notice somebody with a withered hand. And he stops. And he's got this group of Pharisees who are just watching him to see what's going to happen. What's he going to do? Is he going to heal? Because he's already broken the Sabbath law, but is he going to heal this guy on the Sabbath? And again, Jesus asks, as they, makes a statement that just is, is brilliant logic. So he stops, he looks at the man with the withered hand, and he says, get up and come forward. Now, put yourself in that guy's spot. You have a withered hand, this is Jesus, he can heal it, but all of a sudden you're in the middle of this huge political turmoil thing. So he has to get up, he walks over, and there's all these officials, the Pharisees, who are just standing there, just straining their necks, trying to see what Jesus is going to do. And there stands Jesus. And Jesus turns to the Pharisees and he says, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, 
to save a life or to kill? But they kept, there, there's no way they can answer that question. Because if they tell Jesus it's lawful to do good, then they've just given him permission to break the Sabbath. But if they tell him it's not lawful, therefore he should not do anything, that's count, paramount to doing evil. He has the ability to heal this gentleman. In fact, here's another one of their crazy laws. If you were to cut yourself on the Sabbath day, you could put a Band-Aid on it, but you couldn't treat it. So, they, I mean, they had gone down to this level to where it's okay to put a Band-Aid to kind of help stop the bleeding, but you can't treat it. You can't do anything that's going to fix it until after the Sabbath. So, is it doing good? Is that a permittable? Or is it, is it more harm to not do good? And he's got them. And so it tells us then, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. All right, here's where you get to be a Pharisee, okay? What did Jesus do? He didn't touch the man. He didn't ask the man to do anything except talk. It's not a, it's not a crime to hold out your hand. He, what did he do? What did he do to violate the... Nothing. There's nothing that he did to violate... You know what he did? He made the Pharisees look stupid. He showed with one quick action the hardness of their heart. Because here's the difference between a legalist and a person of grace. Jesus walks in. He sees a man who needs help. And he can help him. And he wants to help him. He has compassion for him. And he, he calls the man forward. And the Pharisees, the legalists, are in the back going, Don't you do it. Don't you do it. I'm telling you, don't you do it. And Jesus does it. He takes a stand and he, heal, he, he does what is right. He heals the, the man's hand. And the Pharisees, look at their response. The Pharisees went out and immediately began considering with the Herodians against him, conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. So that... If, if you're a person who writes in your Bible, that's a good verse to circle and just put tipping point number one. Because we've been reading all the way up through this point in Mark about identifying Jesus as the Son of God and seeing his miracles and, and validating his, his ministry and the crowds. And then we see the tension that's building between Jesus and the religious leaders, and it all comes to head right here in verse 6. Because from this point forward, they're determined to kill him. They're no longer just concerned about him. They hate this guy. And so much so, have you, have you heard the phrase, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? That's what you've got right here. So who are the Herodians? The, as you know, the, the Romans controlled this, the, the land of Israel at this time. And so they placed over the land of Israel a, a phony king of the Jews named Herod. Now there were several Herods and so they become a dynasty. And there were, there were Jews who were not religious but they actually believed that God could restore Israel to its national sovereignty through the Herodians, through, through Herod. And so they became supporters of Herod. Now, the Pharisees saw Herod as an imposter. They saw him as, the, as the, uh, the, the heavy hand of the Roman government over the Jews. They hated Herod. But they, in this case, they hate Jesus more than they hate Herod. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they go to the Herodians... Politics makes strange bedfellows, right? They go to the Herodians and they say, look, you've got to help us because the Herodians are concerned too because what is Jesus beginning to claim? That he's the rightful king of Israel. That he's the rightful king of the Jews. Who's that a threat to? The king of the Jews, Herod. And so they have a common interest now. Kill this guy. Get rid of him. And so you can see from this point forward 
this tension will just, get, it's more like, okay, we know we've got to kill him, but now how do we do it? How do we accomplish this? And that's going to be the next several chapters in Mark as they begin to work and plot how to kill Jesus. And so, as we begin to kind of put a bow on this, this whole um, series, and not, not just today, but um, let's look at some of the things that we can, we can learn from what we've seen in, the, in chapters 2 and then this first part of chapter 3. And, and again, our theme has really been dealing with legalism. And the, the description that I've used um, that I find to be best is, is Chuck Swindoll's definition of legalism. And let me share that with you. Legalists are individuals who examine the external behavior of others as a means of gauging their spiritual health when they should give more attention to their own internal thoughts and attitudes in the interest of their own spiritual maturity. Consequently, legalists appear more spiritually strong than others, but are, in truth, the most spiritually anemic. Rather than finding joy in a relationship with the Almighty, they become grace killers, joy stealers, and freedom destroyers. They think they understand grace, but the demands they place on others prove that they haven't for the, fir the first notion of grace as taught by Jesus. That's legalism. So how, how does legalism look today? And that's something that some of us may have experience with and others. You know, honestly, it's one of those things that if you, if you don't kind of know the, what to look for, it's hard to find. But let's, let's use the Sabbath as a great example. Okay, we've been teaching about the Sabbath. Should Christians observe the Sabbath? No. How do I know that? Because the Apostle Paul tells us that Christians do not need to observe the Sabbath. In Romans 14.5, he tells us that there's going to be some that esteem one day and others that esteem another day. But the thing is, they, they need to follow their conviction. All right? So let me give you myself as an example. Sunday is a, a work day for me. It has been for like ever. I mean... I'm coming up on 30 years, so I, I don't remember when Sunday was not a work day. So if I was to say Sunday is a, is a Sabbath day, I've got to work on Sunday. So there's other days of the week that I look towards where I kind of try to keep quiet and keep, look for rest. But here's legalism. So I come in here and I say, we are going to declare Sunday as the Sabbath day. That means that you don't do anything on this day. You come to church, you go home, you take a nap, and then you come back to church tonight. That's what the Sabbath day means. And then we begin to judge you based on how you keep the Sabbath day. So, one of you happens to be driving around. Maybe you've got a string tied to your house and so you can drive around. And you go up to the grocery store. And you see one of your fellow church people in the grocery store on a Sunday. What do you do? You call Mark up. Mark, I just saw Bob up at the grocery store on the Sabbath day. And so the elders call Mark for, or Bob forward. And they say, Bob, is it true? You violated the Sabbath day. And he hem-haws around because he doesn't, you know, he's been caught. But he doesn't want... Do you see how that gets to be... And, and so, all of a sudden, who, who begins to think of themselves as superior? It's the person that can point their finger at someone else. If I happen to be riding my bike around, and I see someone in the grocery store, and I can get back to Mark and let him know that Bob was in the grocery store on the Sabbath day, Mark is going to be like, nice job. You're, you're observing the Sabbath. You're keeping the law. You're helping us out here. Do you see how the, that begins to poison the atmosphere of, of a body, all of a sudden you've got everybody looking out for everybody else. You're looking at the exteriors. Maybe, maybe Bob is the godliest guy in church. Maybe I'm the one that is the most atrocious guy at home, but you'd never know it because I observe the Sabbath day. And Bob breaks the Sabbath day. He goes to the grocery store on Sunday. And do you see how that gets all mixed up and... and it just it creates a bunch of poison. And so it's important 
even in our day of age, that we learn to recognize legalism. Legalism is at the very heart of false religion and false worship. The Pharisees believed they were worshiping God as God wanted to be worshipped. And yet when God stood right before them and corrected and challenged them, they couldn't hear him. Why? Because they were hard-hearted. They had become so convinced of their own rightness that when God himself stands in front of them, verified with miracles and everything else that Jesus verified his ministry with, they couldn't hear it. Legalism makes us feel holy when we are actually hard-hearted and evil. That's a stiff thing to, to say, but people who are legalistic, they, they, they develop a self-righteousness, a piety about them, like, I'm right and you're wrong. Why am I right? Because I play by my rules, which I understand completely, and you don't play by my rules. And they develop this hard-heartedness, and their, their, whole, their whole objective is to point out the wrongs of others. That's a thing to be looking for. Watch out for the, the person who's, who's really displaying their hard-heartedness by the words that they're speaking and the critical spirit that they exhibit. Legalism is a form of control made up of a system of constantly expanding and changing rules. Every week, you come in here and I have a different rule or I have a different nuance for you. Okay, you can go to the grocery store on Sabbath, but you got to make sure that you got a string that's attached to your house and that can get you there and back, okay? Next week, I tell you, all right, you can go to the grocery store, but in addition to the string, you need to have placed food at 3,000 feet because if you don't have food at that point, that indicates that you're too far from home. And so I'm constantly tweaking with the rules. How do you follow this stuff? How, how would you follow it if, if, if on the Sabbath day you had to be aware of lighting a fire or putting out a fire or tying a knot or not tying a knot? And I, it, you can't do it. It's humanly impossible. I mean, there, there, we have reached a point, and there's a book in, um, that you can read that's called Three Felonies a Day. And the person has gone through, and this is with, the, with our federal government. He goes through in this book, and he demonstrates how every single one of us, if the government wanted to, they could prove we break three felonies a day. Three, three laws. I mean, there's so many of them. How, you can't keep track of it. And, and, and so when law begins to expand, it, it becomes a, a system of control. And when that happens within a church, it's deadly. So you have to be on the lookout for this. So how do you survive in an era where legalism is, is going? I mean, again, legalism, we're studying first century Israel. Legalism was at the heart of what they're dealing with. It's no different today. We, we will, mankind tends to grow towards legalism, not grace. And so how do you survive? You have to learn to identify. And we've mentioned several of the identifiers that we're looking for here. Hard-heartedness, joy killers, authoritarians, self-righteous, legalists, and I love this statement, legalists make your business their business. They stick their nose into your business. They're always sticking their nose into your business. That's an easy sign right there. You work with somebody that's always sticking their nose into your business, chances are... They're not your friend. As much as possible, avoid the company of a legalist. You know, when you begin to identify that this person is, is a joy killer, someone who is not gracious in their attitude towards others, don't spend time with them. I mean, don't, don't invest time in that relationship because it's poison. It really is. It's going, to, it's going to suck the life out of you as you try to live according to their standards. And so, when you begin to understand that, you have to guard yourself against that influence because you know that the danger is you then begin to take on their personality. You become the person that can poke out at other people and you become hard-hearted because it feels good. If you, be, you begin to feel superior. You begin to feel like 
I'm better than these people because I play by these rules. And then last, you have to take a stand against them. And boy, that is tough. I mean, I've had people in my years, one, one of my favorite, um, and this is in that category of God bless them, you know, I mean, you, you, but every once in a while, and you really don't see this much anymore, um, those of you that are probably a little bit older can remember this, but there was a time when, especially if you were in a conservative Baptist church, um, there was this like, you know, you had to use the King James Bible. I mean, it was like, that was one of the things. And you would get these folks that would come in after the service, or I'd be teaching a class, and you know, they'd notice that I had read from something that wasn't the King James Bible, and they want to start this whole discussion. You can't win with this logic. I mean, it, it's like, I don't care how much evidence you can pour, uh, and, and I'm not opposed to the King James Bible. I think it's a, one of the monuments of English history. I mean, I think, I think the King James Bible has done more to establish English as the common language around the world than anything else. So, I mean, but at the same time, I'm not one of these people that like, you know, when you get to heaven, Paul and Jesus are going to be reading King James Bibles. And so I'm no, I, don't, I just don't want to argue over that stuff. And that boy, they like to come up and they're just like, you know, this church is terrible. This is a, you know, I can't believe you even call yourself a church because you don't use a King James Bible. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but hey, there's the door, you know, <laughs> go find another church that uses one. That, that kind of thing is just like, they're, they're, you'll never win that argument. You never will, but you've got to stand up against it. Because those folks, once they get planted in your church, and once they get planted into, the, you know, to where their ideas begin to take root, then all of a sudden you have the people that are sitting here going, well, we want to be with Bob, and Bob uses the King James Bible, because he's better than everybody else. And that poison just, it spreads. So you've got to stand up against that. When you see that beginning to take root in some way, some fashion, you just have to, you have to say no. And I think that's one of the key, the key things that elders have to guard against is false teaching and legalism that can enter through the church. And those two things have caused more destruction within churches than we could ever imagine. Jesus gives us the example, and here's, here's our final take-home truth. Our, the Lord's priority is, first and foremost, the heart. And legalism and loopholes only harden what he wants to heal. Jesus walks into a room like this, and he doesn't see, ah, oh, there's Bob, he keeps the Sabbath. Ah, there's Susie, she fasts four times a week. Ah, there's Dan. He gives way above the tithe. He does all this, and, you know. He doesn't walk in the room and that. He walks in, and what does he see? He sees the person with the withered hand, the hurting heart, the person who has been through it all. And they're not here because they know about the Sabbath day or the what time of day to fast or not to fast. They're here because they've heard that Jesus is here. And they just need grace. They need to know that someone loves them. And Jesus looks over this whole room and he pulls that person forward and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Be healed. That is the gospel. In a nutshell, that is the gospel. Jesus is looking for people who have been broken and hurt by this life, and he's saying, come unto me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He's not here to lay layers of, of law upon you. He's here to say, I died for you, and because of that, I can forgive you of all your sins. That withered hand that you carry around that's a sign of all the bad things that you, it's gone. He heals it. He heals it. That's the kind of church we want to be. We want to be a church that is ex just models grace where people who are hurting with withered hands come in and their attitude is, yes, I have found Jesus. I know what grace is.